We've been talking about the basic properties of matter, and on the last few videos, we talked about atoms and elements. And we discussed about how elements are basically different versions of atoms. And that I will add to that on this video that elements are basically something that you cannot chemically break down. Now, it is possible to split the atom physically if you actually destroy the fundamental forces that hold it together or spend enough energy to break them. But you're not going to chemically break down an element. It is as far as you can go. And that's why some people consider the atom the basic unit of matter. Because even though there are smaller particles, it is the first level at which unique chemical and physical characteristics will show up. And you can no longer chemically break that down. And I wanted to give you guys an idea of how many different kinds of elements there are out there. And this is a periodic table that actually shows you visually. And I have one of these in my wall. The, the actual types of elements in the periodic table. And there's a website that's really cool you can go to. It's called periodictable.com where you can actually see a version of this and you can scroll through the elements and see different things about them. It will give you facts about the elements. It will give you the information that you would normally would get in a periodic table and so forth. And you also, if you click on an atom, it will actually take you to a page that will give you lots of information about the element. And we will do a project that's called Knowing the Elements. And in that project, you can go here to get a lot of information. And there's another one called webelements.com. But it's a really good way to actually get information about elements. And it's really cool because it's visual and really interactive. And there's also apps for iPads and iPhones and other uh, devices which will do kind of the same thing. So those are our elements. And as you can see, a lot of them have this metallic look to them. But there's also a lot of variety in the way the elements look like and a lot of elements in the periodic table. Over 112 elements have already been identified and named. The last one officially was the Copernicum, which is 112. Remember, you can only name an element once it's stable enough to survive a certain period of time. And the odd is on to successively name 113 and above to actually get um, more a credit for actually naming these and some scientists are trying to do that but it, they only last a very small period of time because remember these were all uh, human synthesized elements now in the periodic table you will see all these elements but you saw examples of how they look like but the thing is some elements will show up in nature looking in different ways here you see an example of carbon carbon will look in a lot of different ways you can get carbon polymers you can get carbon nets, you can get carbon crystals, you can get things like charcoal. You have the carbon that you use in your pencil, this is coming basically charcoal. You have carbon that sh shows up in molecules of life and long strings. And you even have carbon compressed and under high pressure and cooked into diamonds, as you see up there, which is an almost perfect crystalline structure. And so whenever you have an element that has different uh, physical characteristics or physical views in nature, now, they're still the same element. They're all made of the same number of protons, and they're all made of the same kind of um, atom. But they can organize themselves in different physical setups when you look at them. That is what we call uh, allotropes. Each one of these views that you see here is a different allotrope of carbon. So each allotrope is a different physical version of an element or a substance made up of an element. All of these are pure substances in the sense they're all pure carbon. Unless, there's, of course, there's a little bit of impurity in the, in the actual composition there. But even, even then, there are different versions or arrangements for carbon uh, elements. And so, there you see. Substances based on carbon can arrange themselves in different ways. Each one of them is called allotropes. Another way to look at differences within the same element is not so much in the way it physically looks, but in the actual composition of the nucleus of the atom. And we call those isotopes. Now here you see an example of several different kinds of isotopes. Look, for example, the most common element in the universe is called hydrogen. And you see that hydrogen normally only has one proton in its nucleus, and it's surrounded by one electron. Now, no matter what kind of hydrogen you have, it's always going to be one proton, which is featured in red over here. Because that's what makes it a hydrogen atom, the fact that it only has one proton. But some hydrogens are what we call heavy hydrogens, 
because they literally have a bigger atomic mass because they have a greater number of neutrons. Now, in the case of hydrogen 2, you wouldn't even need this neutron. That neutron over there is completely useless because, remember, neutrons are only existing to separate the protons within the nucleus of an atom. So, to have the extra neutron there fulfills no purpose whatsoever. And so, this will be an unstable hydrogen that will tend to decay over time and the weak force is going to be interacting with that neutron and causing it to actually decay and the quarks are going to change and you're going to get all kinds of decay and we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about radioactivity same thing is true about this hydrogen which is very heavy hydrogen which it has two neutrons instead of one but all of them are hydrogen and each of these is called an isotope isotope iso means the same tope means types so these are atoms of the same type, and the only difference between them is the number of neutrons. Now remember, the atomic mass number is determined by the number of protons plus neutrons. So while this hydrogen will have an atomic mass number of 1, this one will have an atomic mass number of 2, and this one will have an atomic mass number of 3. And that's the little number you see on the top over there. Now, that is why when you actually ask the periodic table and you go look at it, what is the atomic mass or the atomic weight for hydrogen? They write 1.00794, all right? Because if you actually look at the nature, you can find three different types of hydrogen. So this is the average atomic mass for hydrogen in AMUs. Remember, AMUs, each AMU is one twelfth of the average mass of carbon. And so that is how you get that number. Now, just look at helium here as another example. There's two kinds of helium. You have helium-3 and helium-4. You see how helium-3 has three mass number because it has two protons and one neutron, and then helium-4 with two neutrons. But notice that whichever one you look at, it's going to have two protons because that's what makes it a helium. Same thing for lithium. It has three protons, three neutrons, atomic mass number of six. But there's a version with seven that has an extra neutron, which is not necessary. It's going to decay over time. And see, now I hope you understand what that actually means then for um, what is a different isotope, basically. So an isotope will be a different type of the same element. And remember, the element is going to be one specific type of an atom. And what makes them all the same atom is the fact that they have all the same atomic number which means every single one of these isotopes is going to have the same physical properties. They're going to act the same, they're going to look the same. But, since they have a different mass number, they're technically not the same atom, they're the same element, but the element is slightly different. So that's why we call them isotopes. Now, that's why when you calculate the atomic mass or the atomic weight of the atom, you have to consider all the different isotopes that exist in nature for that kind of atom. For example, the hydrogen atom, like we said, has an atomic mass number, or atomic mass weight, sorry, atomic weight of 1.0074. But the actual atomic mass number of the most common type of hydrogen atom is 1. So why is it 1.0074? Remember, if the, if the AMU is basically the mass of carbon-12 divided by 12, that means that you're going to have basically... This is going to be 12 over 12, which is going to be 1. So 1 AMU is basically the mass of 1 nucleon. So why isn't hydrogen 1 for the, his atomic weight if it normally has 1 nucleon, which is the proton? Because it could also have 2 or 3 nucleons if it has the isotopes that have the extra neutrons. And so what you have to do is something that looks like this. For example, you would get the mass of the first isotope, let's say 10, and I don't know what atom I'm talking about here, but just in general, and you're going to multiply that by how common this isotope is in nature, say 98% common in nature, and you're going to add to this the mass of the second isotope, say 12, because it has two extra neutrons, and you're going to write down how common it is in nature, say 0.02. Then you divide that by the total, in this case, is going to be 22. And this is going to have what's going to determine your actual mass number. What you did here is you did a weighted average. Because the isotope 10 is more common in nature, it should count more than the one that's less common in nature. 
So when we say that the mass of hydrogen is 1.0074, we're basically saying that this is the most likely number of that hydrogen atom. And that's actually a manifestation of the fact that the hydrogen atom only has one, usually, but very rarely it may have extra nucleons, which is where you get the 7-4 at the end here. But since they're very, 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 very rare, they barely change the atomic mass of the atom. So usually the actual mass number of the most stable isotope is, very, is going to very closely match the actual mass atomic weight of the isotope. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is that some of these isotopes are going to be unstable. And they're going to undergo what we call radioactive decay where they will release particles and energy as the nucleus falls apart. Either because it cannot hold itself together, it's too big to actually for the strong force to overcome the electromagnetic interactions between the protons, even with the neutrons which are in between them, or because it has extra neutrons which are not necessary, which actually almost invites the weak force to interact with the uh, the, with the quarks inside those neutrons and make the, them change and then stabilize the atom. But we'll talk about this in the next video and I'll see you guys then.